to order SDPM. Oh. And Steve is going to give us an update on progress to date. I am. So while I'm pulling this up, you should have a packet of papers uh, that was uh, provided at the meeting on Thursday. There we go. Uh, so we've had two meetings. Uh, our first meeting was on Thursday at North Central Junior High. About 40 people there total, including administrators. Um, and then we were at Liberty High School last night. Uh, and uh, we had probably 80-ish, Bill? Yeah, it was -ish. Good, it was a very Yeah, so we about doubled the crowd uh, last night. Um, a lot of first-time attenders at both meetings. Did the little informal. How many of you were here with us in 2015-16? It was a fairly small number of hands that went up. Um, talked to quite a few of the people that were there. We had a lot of people who actually don't even have kids in our district yet. Um, Four-year-olds, three-year-olds uh, that were, were present with us on both evenings. They came back the second night, which I was pleased to see. Uh, and uh, we walked through uh, one main activity on, uh, uh, on uh, that first Thursday, which was to help them understand what Appendix 5 is and what it does. <coughs> so we walked through uh, what Appendix 5 is, what it does. Um, actually, in the back up just a second. We walked them through a little bit of what, what happened in 2013-14 and what happened in 2015-16. Then as a group, they sat down. Uh, they looked at uh, the factors, uh, the 21 factors. We had a big discussion about the fact that many of them uh, are counter uh, to each other. So uh, if you pick one, you couldn't pick the other one. We then asked them to go through uh, and tell us uh, of those 21 factors, which ones, I'm going to, where's the input on that? There we go. Uh, which ones were most important to them? Uh, a little hard to see up here, but as you look at uh, your list, uh, you should have the Appendix 5 list in front of you. Number nine, keeping communities of students together was the biggest one. If you remember back in 15, 16, we spent a lot of time talking about neighborhoods uh, and uh, the importance of keeping neighborhoods intact. Uh, the second uh, one that received the greatest uh, 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 response rate was minimizing student disruptions. Um, from the conversation at the tables, it was, I prefer not to have my kid go to multiple schools during either the time they're in elementary or I don't want you to change my feeder pattern path as they move through the secondary schools. Uh, and then we had uh, a couple of them uh, at seven in the responses, address immediate short term and long term uh, needs and then minimizing transportation distances. Uh, you'll note on the, uh, the free response section uh, in the safety one, there was a lot of conversation about uh, sidewalks. We did happen to have a North uh, Liberty City Councilor with us, um, and I know the folks at his table talked to him at length about um, seeking sidewalks uh, on some of the routes right now that don't have sidewalks in North Liberty, and where is the plan for that, and when is that going to happen type of thing. Uh, and then there's a cluster of them that came in at 6. Uh, if you look across your chart there, uh, promoting safety, uh, again, quite a few safety considerations about busy streets, considering projections uh, for future uh, growth, uh, not allowing schools to become too big, and uh, considering what geographic barriers are. We also talked to them a little bit about the 15-16 discussion about geographic barriers. What does that mean? It's not just mountain ranges, um, it's also roads uh, and railroads. Uh, we use the example of the Longfellow Twain and is Kirkwood uh, the geographic factor or is the railroad the geographic factor? So I um, had some conversation with them about that. So what you have in front of you is their response rate to the 21 items and then their free response rate uh, below that is we asked them the second round was tell us what that means to you in your neighborhood. And at your table try to come up with at least five things that we should consider as we go through that process of drafting maps. So we know what your, your top ones are from the policy standpoint, but what does that mean at home? What does that mean to you when you're sending your kids off to school? And so that's what the free response is. I will spend a lot of time walking through that with you. You can see the categories uh, that those fell out in, and I can come back to that uh, if, uh, if you'd like to discuss that further. Then, get the right one here. What we did was we took that back and we looked at uh, the attendance areas uh, that are currently approved by the board for 2019-20. And um, you can see we put the big maps up here uh, that uh, we ran off on the, on the large scale printer today to show um, what this looks like. So it's up on the screen, up on the wall. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn around and refer to this one on the wall over here. Based on the feedback, um, one of the things that we looked at was the current attendance areas as approved by the board. 
for Garner, for Van Allen, for Wickham, and we left those intact. We did not touch those. So these are exactly the same boundary maps that were approved by the board uh, after the 15-16 community engagement process. Did not touch those. Then what we did is we looked at, uh, this is the location for the new Christine Grant Elementary School on Mahaffey Bridge Road. And uh, we began to look at the population of students that were originally assigned to Scanlon Elementary School and the students that were assigned to Penn Elementary School. If you'll notice on the, uh, the verbatim uh, input uh, that came from folks, one of the big issues of concern that came up at quite a few of the tables when we talked about them was the parents who live in what was uh, the North Liberty attendance area and what was the North Wickham attendance area said, we understand you need to send us somewhere after you build this map. Where you send us is very important to us because we would prefer not to cross the feeder streams for the secondary schools. That is, please don't send us somewhere that's going to go to Northwest and West if indeed you are going to build the Scanlon Farms Elementary School and then put us back on the track that goes to North Central and Liberty. Because the, the Lincoln parents in particular said, we know what that feels like. As I went from table to table, we, they said, we've been through that. We've been at West and we've been at City and now you say we're going to Liberty, so pick a path for us and leave us on that path. So that was front and center when we were thinking about this process. So what we did was we built a geographically compact, again, go back to your factors, geographically compact attendance area uh, for uh, uh, Grant Elementary School. And then we uh, took the North Lincoln and the North Wickham and the remainder of the Penn students and fed them into Penn Elementary School. If you look at, and this will help you, I think, as you go through this, <coughs> if you look at a map, and I'm going to pull the Grant map up, this comes out of our uh, tenants uh, software. Uh, each one of those dots represents a household uh, that sends kids to school. So if you if you look at this area, you know you can see that essentially out here, as you get out towards the uh, uh, the river and the reservoir, uh, no development, right? So we've got a handful of scattered kids out here and out here. Most of our kids think Fox Run, think, think Cedar Springs, uh, live in here, and then there's another group. Uh, down here uh, near Penn Meadows. So uh, when you look at, uh, and again, this was a, a crucial factor for us as we were doing the thinking ahead piece. Um, look at the Penn attendance area. <coughs> again, on here, uh, you can see uh, these students that are part of the current uh, Penn attendance area. And then uh, these are the students here that are part of the North uh, Wickham attendance area, and then the kids here that are currently attending Lincoln Elementary School. Uh, we know, uh, again, to orient you, uh, here's Liberty High School, right where the cursor is. Uh, so we know that there's growth going on here. Uh, we know that there's some planted growth over here. Uh, when you think about the northwest side of the, uh, uh, the roundabout up there. And so if I can go to the presentation, there we go. This was the slide deck that was shared uh, with the crew last night. Uh, one of the things that we did was look at capacity numbers. Sorry for the quick scroll here. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, was a concern uh, at many of the tables, remember, it was planned for immediate, short, and long term. Uh, and so you'll notice that uh, there's about 75 uh, seats available. Uh, at Grant Elementary School. Uh, we know from talking to the folks at uh, North Liberty, the municipality, uh, that uh, many of the areas on the north side of those suburbs uh, are areas that they have not currently extended sewer and water, and they don't plan to in the near future. So we know that if there's growth going to happen out there, it's going to be some time. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of space. We still have 75 empty seats there. Um, Garner uh, and Nick's here. One of the things that uh, we talked about, Nick and I were looking at the number on here. We want to go back and look at this. We know we took this off the, uh, the one chart, uh, but we think this was before uh, the addition. Uh, and so we've got to go take a look at uh, uh, that and make sure that that number is correct. Uh, Nick thinks we might be missing a couple of classrooms with the kids. Uh, so we're just under uh, the capacity there, but uh, you may want to think a bit closer to 575, but Nick is working with Dwayne on that to make sure. Um, but again, if you look at Grant, uh, we also know uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at uh, Garner, um, we also know that uh, relatively compact attendance area, you can see that most of the area is already developed. There's a small area out here uh, that still might be open for growth. Uh, so there is some space left. <coughs> Oops. No, I'm going to get the right one. There we 
There we go. There's some space left at Garner, not a substantial amount of space, but uh, also not significant growth. Penn, on the other hand, has quite a bit of space uh, available. And again, part of that was the conversation uh, that was had uh, at the table and then the follow-up uh, in regard to uh, potential areas for growth uh, in and around uh, Liberty High School. So that is a quick drive-by on our process. Phil was there. Sean was at one of them. Paul was at one of them. I'd certainly invite the three of you to, to chime in on high points that uh, we might have missed that would uh, help the rest of the board come up to speed. Just one uh, question. With, with these graphs that you have, do you have any idea on uh, busing requirements? Or yeah, we did. That's a great question, Phil. We did not run any <coughs> transportation uh, requirements. Uh, we knew, uh, and this was another one that came up at one of the tables, uh, uh, the, the Liberty uh, folks and the Wickham folks were already presumed to be bused uh, in the previous Scalin Farms uh, elementary school uh, process uh, simply because we knew that the build-up wouldn't be there yet for uh, walking paths. I don't know the implications for uh, the uh, Christine Grant. We did not uh, run those. Is, is there any idea that that would be available? Oh, oh, a timeline as far as when, when we might have any... Uh, you know, Probably ideas. when we get a little closer to the final part of the process. We have to pay Durham to do those transportation sure. runs for us, and we prefer not to do them on every iteration. So you. we're hoping when we get a little bit closer to the end, then we can ask them to, to run that for us. We do know, and that was another issue that came up uh, fairly frequently. <coughs> when you look at the safety section, it talks a lot about walking. Um, so you'll notice that there's a lot of very specific <coughs> feedback uh, from the parents that were present about which neighborhoods they would like to see go to Grant. Much of that table discussion was about the fact that their kids can walk to the school. And so they had said, we want to make sure our kids go there because they can walk there. So you'll see that a lot for the, the Cedar Springs, Fox Run, some of those other surrounding subdivisions. Well, and on the safety issue, uh, too, it's crossing a busy street. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a There's a whole bunch of that on safety, and then you kind of also see it when you look at the boundaries when they talk about uh, the neighborhoods and the streets. The, the, the table I was sitting at, uh, at the <coughs> first one before we had maps, just when we were kind of going through the different things that were important to us, I was sitting with a gentleman I hadn't met before. Um, He's kind of new to our district. I think he said he's been here only like this is only the second year in the district. Uh, but he lives in a specific <coughs> neighborhood that we then got an email about, uh, which is just north of Penn Meadows Park there. That uh, uh, both he and the, the email talk about being able to walk like through the park down to Penn. Right. But in this scenario, they'd be going across front slash Mahaffey Bridge Road over to the new school. And you know, if you kind of look at Grant and Penn, they kind of sit on top of each other, right? Yep. I was just curious as to what the numbers would look like if it wasn't that straight line and it did a zigzag on front. Yep, so if you look over here, I don't know if how that changes the cursor around, it's this piece right here. If I stand over here, it's, it's the neighborhood <coughs> right here. So it's, uh, it's this piece right here. We didn't run that scenario yet. I, I saw that input that came from the just, board. Just, they're just kind of... Mm -hmm. Little clusters on either side mm -hmm. of front south of Penn, and a little cluster yep. on either side of front north Penn. And we draw a line this way. I'm just wondering if it did this. And that what would it, I don't know the total numbers and the demographics yep. and how that all would change. I would be curious as to what that would do, and that would allow that group to not have to cross that mm -hmm. street. I mean, they're really close to the new school, but they're also really close to Penn in that neighborhood, yeah. too. So. And I, I know uh, when we were looking at it, essentially part of the conversation is okay, do you cross? Is it a north-south cross or an east-west cross? And so I think that that's part of the issue that we got to look at as we move forward. With that. Being a North Liberty resident, I can tell you that the traffic going out Mahaffey Bridge Road between North Liberty and Solon has a lot more traffic on it than and Penn. Fast. But I don't know if now that Penn's paved all the way down and around to Liberty, if that has a lot more traffic on it than it ever used to. That was a debate at one of the tables last night about what's going to happen in the future with traffic patterns. Say hard to I think there's a lot of traffic places within the district itself already that we have to cross. I mean, when we cross the Scott Boulevard, there's 20 kids that cross Highway 6. Sure. Um, so Definitely a scenario we can run, though. I just, I mean, I'm looking at dots on a page and trying to guess how many <laughs> dots are in this little pile and how many dots are in this yeah, little pile. Yeah, remember those are households. <laughs> so some so of those households have more than one kid. So I mean, it may yeah. dramatically change numbers. Yeah. I don't really know. Something to look at. For the next session, the next community meeting is 
29th. Yes, so we got input. We put draft on it. Um, so it hasn't, we haven't categorized it at all. The, I mean, you see I always alpha sort these, um, so there's no prominence given into them. Um, but this is all the raw input from last night. Thank you to Kim for keystroking it all in this afternoon in short notice. Um, but that's all the raw input from last night. Um, last night's session, uh, for those of you that were present in 15, 16, last night's session was 45 minutes, Lori. Um, <laughs> it's gonna get longer. Lori's at some of the marathon ones uh, before. Um, Pick up but, speed as they, it's like yeah, snowball. it went pretty quick. Um, uh, feedback uh, was good at the tables. Uh, they were coming to some uh, fairly quick consensus on some of the things I liked and like about it. You'll see that in the, the pros and cons. Uh, we use this as an iterative process. So again, you look at the agenda. We talked to them to understand what they wanted. And we drew a map, took the map out to them. They gave us some feedback. Map's here for you for feedback. We have a session scheduled tomorrow. Amy and Adam and I will sit down and, and uh, take a crack at another round of maps. We take both round one and round two back to the community next Monday night. So they get a chance to take a look at it, bring it back to you. Uh, and so we'll go through that process. Uh, last time around took us, I don't know, we were on like double letters or something when we were drawing maps. I don't think we'll go like that far this something. time because mm -hmm. we don't have as much complexity with it. But the idea is hopefully within three or four iterations we get something that the uh, largest number of the people that are present at the meeting have some level of comfort with. We shared with them that one of the reasons that we come back and forth to you at the work session is we don't want to spend a lot of time working on the map. All of a sudden it shows up in front of you and you guys say, eh, absolutely not. So. This gives us that opportunity to take your input, their input, and try to keep drawing maps that get closer and closer to um, what hopefully is, is a final decision. Will you pull back up the page that has uh, all the schools together and want to put their capacity in CSLS? Oops. No, nope. sorry. Here we go. And you have this uh, deck. <coughs> so that should be in your, your handouts. This is all posted on. Um, uh, tonight's board docs and then it's also on a uh, page that it lives on the facility master page uh, master plan page but it's also linked directly to each of the elementary schools so parents can punch out right through it they don't have to dig around and look for it one of the things uh, that was asked last night uh, was hey thanks very much for this data but just for comparison's sake can you help us understand what this data looks like for Van Allen and Wickham? We're probably also going to run it for uh, Corville Central, just kind of do this north of 80 thing so that people can see it. One of the big questions that uh, folks had, Christy and I talked about this at length, is where do the kids go now? So I'll use Grant for you. So if you look at Grant Elementary School, this tells you that right now there are 552 kids that live in the Grant attendance area. Of those, 179 attend Borlaug, so think your Cedar Springs, Fox Run kids. 355 are Penn kids, uh, and we've got 10 Van Allen kids, and then we've got several schools that have less than five. Borlaug, Lucas, Shimmick, Wickham. Why is Wickham on there twice? Um, and uh, it's got to be a typo somewhere. Um, but uh, uh, those are kids that are voluntarily transferred uh, to somewhere else. So in some cases, you'll see some ELL kids in there. And remember, one of the things that's our goal for next year is to have ELL programming in every school. Um, so there may be a handful of kids that may be ELL students that are uh, voluntarily transferred out of one of those schools. But most of them are voluntarily transferred. Um, parent choice may have moved in from another attendance area. So, so those who are there, Amy, John, Paul, Phil, what else do we need to tell them? Those that weren't there, what else can we answer for you? I would just kind of ask the question because it's been asked of us multiple times, particularly the handful of folks in that North Lincoln. I, I've said that it made perfect sense for them to go to Grant when it was, you know, a lot closer to them. It didn't make sense for them to go to Grant, which I appreciate that's not how it is. But it does make total sense for them to go to Liberty because it's right there. Um, so I see how keeping that feeder in place works nicely there, but you're sending them up to Penn and I know that there, a lot of them had voiced their concern, all right, what year do we get a move, right? They, that was there's no space for them next year, right? So that, that was a question that came up last night, uh, and uh, the question was, and this has always been the question, is when you find a home for us, can we apply for voluntary transfer into that school? So there were quite a few parents that were North Lincoln parents last night that said, hey, 
I know I'm zoned to go out here next year during the renovations. Is it possible for me to apply for a voluntary transfer to go to Penn uh, for that year? So that if I'm going to go there in 1920 anyway, can I go there in 1819? So that one of their questions was that, but then their bigger question, at least the one table was, and if you don't decide to send me to Penn and you pick Gardner or Van Allen to send me to instead, can I apply to go there because that's one less transition for my students? So we did tell them that that voluntary transfer process is already always open. Christy, tell you, Penn's pretty full right now. As I say, there's, um, there's no room for it. Do you know, what do you know I, how many kids that is? There are 107 kids total uh, that live, and you can see it right here. There are 107 Lincoln kids that right now uh, are zoned to go somewhere. Right. Uh, so one of the things that I told the parents was I understand A, their desire, and B, their concern about safe space at Penn. I said, if, let's not get the cart before the horse. Let's see what decision the board makes, and then we'll look at what alternatives might be available to us for that following year. There's not room for 107 more kids at Penn next year. Not right now there aren't. Maybe seven. They said they, I don't know, maybe we got to figure out how to get creative. <laughs> Christy was worried about my creativity last night. <laughs> so I guess what we need from you now is what directions do you have for us, what input do you have from us, so when we sit down tomorrow and start moving lines around, what things besides the input that we got from the folks last night would you like us to think about? I will take a look at Penn. That's the only one that stands yep. out to me. I mean, I, crossing 965 is a not a great thing for anybody, but you got all of those <coughs> kids yep. on the west side, 965, right, yep. are, are going to Garner. <coughs> you got to cross it to get to any of them. Yep. Um, so that's important. And that's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. But So that's yep, kind of crappy. But that little bit there, yep. not having to cross Front Street, yeah. depending on how that balances we the definitely numbers. definitely over to that, that map. number of Wickham kids is relatively small. It is. Um, yep. And, and again, we've, we've received some emails. Got 54 um, kids there. Well, 50, 54 to Penn, um, 24 to Gardner. I guess I'd have to see which ones are going where. Is the 24? See, I, I got to go back and look. I know this line is right. I'm not sure what I got going on down here. There's some kind of cut paste error in there, so I got to figure yeah, that out. Yeah, because it seems like it's just one little area that yeah. I don't think they could yeah, I I think it's I think it's 54, but I got to go back and look. Uh, okay, all right. Um, so. Uh, you see, we probably have 24 Garner students at Wickham, so I wonder if that's um, since we don't have some of the same programming. Yeah. So that might be a point of clarification. Check uh, out because yeah, yeah. Garner does not have ELL or some of the modified yeah. programming. So we'll that we'll get that cleaned up. That's probably it. Yeah, just it makes sense. Just an FYI, and Adam's not here, so I do have to give him a, a, a big shout out. So we had that meeting on Thursday. We came back, met with him on Friday, and said, hey, here's what they told us. Um, let's sit down uh, Friday afternoon and, and draw up some lines on the map. Now I need final product from you, including all these numbers. And so he did all this work on Sunday for me and sent it to me. So um, we will sit down tomorrow and make sure we get those numbers cleaned up. So we've received some emails from some of the North Wickham people that have um, said that they're not crazy about changing schools. Yeah. Um, frequently, because uh, in their case, it's not even as bad as North Lincoln, um, but uh, they uh, would potentially be going to Scanlon when that's built. And that's one of the things that they had asked about was, could we do one of those maps that shows this stuff for Wickham too? And, and they were pretty direct with me to say, if there's room for the 54 of us, could we just stay? At so, Wickham. At Wickham. So that was their question. <coughs> now, there was a couple, there was a little dissent at that table because um, the one mom said, now wait a minute, that's alternate path. It's a Wickham <coughs> path, not a Liberty High path. What does that mean for our kids? And what if we get zoned, what if you build Scanlon Farms Elementary School because we know you assign kids to high schools based on their elementary school attendance zone. Are you going to make us cross paths again at that point in time? I said, I, I don't know what it will look like by the time your kids get to be that age. So that's something we'll have to take into consideration. But that opportunity might be there. We might, be, If you remember at one point in time, we were drawing some flex areas. You could go here, you could go there. That might be an opportunity to look at too. 
So we'll get those numbers, uh, this chart filled out for Wickham too, so that you can take a look at that the next time we get together and we can have the parents look at it too. Yeah, because one of the cons that's listed here is that the Forest Gate neighborhood yep. is within walking distance, so adding a whole bus. V visual distance, they'll tell you. Yeah, for adding a whole bus route at 40 grand. Yep. For yep. kids that maybe don't really want to move twice. Yep. Yeah. Well, parents. <laughs> they're, they're flexible. Yeah. And that's, uh, I tell you what, when we come back then, uh, when we go back to the parents, we will draw, we'll, we'll pull those numbers out and we'll look at them going both ways and flex. I think we can do all three of those. What else? I'd like to thank Lori and forwarded me an email that came in from a parent. If you get an email from a parent that, that has something in it that you think is going to impact us as we go through uh, uh, putting that information together in maps, if you could please forward that to me so that I can make sure that those comments um, are included in our thought process, that would be awesome. As she said to me in the email, I hope you don't get seven forwards. I take seven forwards versus zero, so that's okay. <coughs> don't worry about that. You can forward it seven times, that's that's perfectly fine. I can process those. I'd rather do that than miss one of those comments. Yeah, nice work. This looks good. So far so good. Yeah, it's making good. To start, we got great input. We've had good dialogue, we had great turnout. That's good. So it was, it was I was optimistic and Edith's back there. She's got her hand up. Would you like to say something? Please I, do. I feel like I need to put in a plug for I know you're talking um, significantly north of, of Kirkwood, but um, Kirkwood is sitting at 75% poverty, and if we don't start looking at, at some of the other neighborhoods around us, we're going to remain at 75% poverty, and is that what we want? I think that's part of the second point we're getting to. Okay. We might touch on that here. And I, I did share with uh, the parents at both meetings. I walked them through. There's a slide in there that shows the process, and we did talk about uh, that next steps are the board really wants to look at some big picture issues, and that even if we do come up with a resolution for these two attendance areas so that you have some level of certainty of knowing what's next, that if the term I used was if we unzip the whole package and start looking at all 12, 20 elementary areas, that doesn't mean that because we had this conversation, that this is not part of that next phase of the discussion. So I was, I was pretty clear with them at both of those meetings so that they understood. This gives us a place so that we've got that holder in there, but we may be looking at other alternatives moving forward, and you're part of the family, and you'll be part of that family discussion. So maybe, Steve, it might be helpful, because Kirkwood, you know, is kind of close to this. Uh, you know, we might be peeling off some of these neighborhoods we're talking about. Could we kind of have an idea of what some of those neighborhoods might be and just kind of start that discussion as we're moving forward so we can we'll run we'll run that map too okay. uh, and maybe i'll just kind of come down here and, and pull this map so that we can see all of them and include that in the uh packets uh and the slides for the next pair of presentation too yeah that'd be great just so, we, so people have their heads around like what that means like oh you this might change well what does it mean and i think we'll get more conversation on it absolutely I mean, is it a good segue to the next item? It's an ideal segue to the next item. Yeah, and I, I was wondering, since we're segueing, Anita, do you want to expand on that some more? Can, can I just ask, maybe if we bring the principals to the table? Well, I invited the them audience? all, but they chose this in there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's weird, because we don't usually interact with the audience. Please. Yeah, I, I invited them, but they, they all did. She did. She did. She did. <laughs> So the next topic's kind of yours, so I'll turn that over to, to you guys to start the, the conversation. Who wants to, go? Who wants to jump in? <laughs> I'll go, just, you know, because, you know, you did bring up the, the topic, and I think we've discussed in a couple of, of work sessions that we really need to, um, I don't know, start really thinking outside the box of how we're going to do stuff. You know, we can do so much with boundaries, we can do so much with programming, um, and then you start looking a little bit, you know, beyond that when you start to look at, you know, 
sister schools or magnet schools or <coughs> anything like that that is going to directly affect all those things. And then I kind of brought it up at the at the board table that that's something we really need to be deliberate about. And I, I as we were getting our update from the equity committee when they had their whole calendar all scheduled out of how they want to attack things, like that's forcing them and then us to be deliberate. And I think that's really what we need to do is to be more deliberate of how we're gonna attack these things. And, you know, we recognize the need to develop the, the boundary around grant as a sort of immediate need because you know, the boundary that takes place in a year and a half, that, that's no good. Um, so that kind of jumped to the top as a thing. Um, but we didn't want to have that just sort of in a vacuum all by itself. Um, so we have started the conversation and I think that that's where we kind of stall out is that, okay, what, what, what do you do, do next? You know, what can we do? And I think that's where we really need to kind of have those timelines put in place and what all we want to accomplish and, and really have a structure as to how we want to try and address some of the, the balance needs. You know, JP talks about it a lot, uh, you know, balance header elementary schools and the class size stuff is a, is a big thing as well. So definitely having the conversations, but I, I think my struggle personally is, all right, we talked about it. What do we do? And, and, and I don't know. And so I think this is the opportunity for everybody that has way more experience in you know, what works in schools than I do to give us some thoughts on it. And I would welcome it. So a few years back, um, we had talked about the RAM being a short-term um, solution, a mid-range solution being looking at boundaries, re, um, you know, reconfiguring the boundaries, and a long-term solution being working with the municipalities so that when we create new attendance areas, those are already diverse. And, and so I think <coughs> we at some point have to really go after that long range piece with our municipalities and say, if, if we build school here, we want very um, housing, we want mixed neighborhoods. We don't want all of one group of people and then have to bus everybody back and forth. We want diversity, if that's truly what we want. That's what I believe we want. I, you know, I'm with you, Anita, I do too. The, and I think that conversation is happening. I, I can't say I'm optimistic. Uh, I mean, so Coralville's done a little tiny bit of that. Iowa City has done a little. And then it's lauded as this amazing thing that nobody's ever done before. But it's microscopic. It, I mean, it's not going to touch num numbers like this to do, uh, you know, some of the housing maybe can be kind of affordable, but you can buy it out. You know, I mean, they're just, it's very convoluted because what I'm finding out is municipalities can try to do some of that, but developers really, at the end of the day, are going to be who develops property. And it's, so I just don't, I think we have to keep pushing that. And I think, you know, I think that's been our sentiment, not just this board, but many boards going back. And I think we probably have some pretty good momentum in a lot of our municipalities that are on board with this. And then my sense is what they find out is, and then you get elected, and then you talk to the developers, and they're the ones who are going to build the thing. And they, and so there, it's just, I think it's, I think it'll be hard for us to bank on that making any impact outside of 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. So that's really good to know. So then if that's not a viable solution, then I think we do have to be talking about, do we do, there, I think there are many options that are um, educationally sound. It's what will this community get behind? We can do sister schools. We can do year round school. We can do lot, you know, um, school. We can do any of those things if the community believes in it and if the community wants to support it. Well, yeah, I think we went through that magnet, whole magnet uh, school exploratory process and, and set people off the map of Maryland, Massachusetts, Massachusetts uh, to study the schools and then when we came back we passed off the, you know, the survey, would you send your kid to a magnet school? And, you know, the overwhelming answer was no. So that kind of 
you know, if there's no <coughs> what, what kind of magnet? I mean, did you say like so? I we on a survey. Was it so? I, for example, any this is completely anecdotal, but any time I talk to anyone, almost about a year-round school, they're like, sign me up, and that's staff and so if so, what I wonder was a survey like, did you give people options like? This is what a year-round school looks like. That could be a consideration. This is what a foreign language immersion looks like. Yeah. That could be something was that we could offer. There were some options for them. And, and the, the big one that we found was uh, there was a high level of correlation between I like my neighborhood school and everyone likes their neighborhood mm -hmm. school. The Kirkwood kids and their parents like their neighborhood Absolutely. school. The Twain kids and parents. The Lincoln kids and parents. And so we asked them, what's your, what's your uh, opinion of your school? super high. So by and large across the district, the parents love the school that's in their neighborhood. And then, so then what we found was there's a high correlation between I like my neighborhood school and I would pass on a magnet school if it wasn't in my neighborhood. Um, and it's just because they like, they like going to Kirkwood, they like going to Twain, they feel like they're home there. And, and they, if the option was to leave my home school, I don't know if I want to do that. Which it, it's a good problem to have, but it's also a bit of a challenge, too. Well, and that's the thing about a magnet. I think anything we have to do, like a magnet, we'd have to pilot some some ideas, right, and see if it works. Because if it doesn't work, we're not going to marry ourselves to something that, that's not working. The other thing that we could do, you know, and this goes to the article that Steve sent out, with boundaries is just gerrymander. <coughs> you know, but that, and I guarantee you people are going to... But the thing is... Everybody says they like the balance, but when it comes down to, okay, now we're talking about your school, no, no, now I don't like it. And we are going to run into that, and I think at some point we as a board, yeah. well, of course, yeah, we're, that will, and it will be, there will be hundreds of people at those meetings, and they'll be very angry, and they'll be, but it's not fair. That, that's why we, that, this is a fight, this is a civil rights fight, it is, and nobody in the status quo wants to be upset, nobody wants, because yeah. it's really good at their school. Um, but the truth is, uh, you know, I was sitting at Taekwondo the other night, and I was talking to a lady who's like, oh, we just moved here, my husband's a doctor, and, and we tell me about the schools. And I'm like, hell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you tell her you were a board member? Uh, not at first. <laughs> uh, I was like, let me fill this up a little bit. And she's like, we just, we can't go to Global Central. Just, oh we looked it up online. <clears throat> the test score. We have to go to Wickham. And I said, I said, you know, you, you, you need to, and I told her, I said, you need to go talk to the principal. Yeah. Just go meet them and talk to, to people. Her. But that's one person who happened to have a conversation with a board member at a Taekwondo meet, but there's hundreds of people yeah. who all they do is look up Zillow and look at that score, and that's yeah. it. And that drives them to make purchasing decisions, and it exacerbates the problem. Yeah. And the yeah. one thing, this board, we have the power just to say it's not that way. Like, I don't care what you do in <coughs> Singapore North Liberty, we get to draw the boundaries for these schools. And then that's, the problem is, with the board, I think, is that we, you know, we're such a young board, and we're all, it's always been a young board, so recently. So there's no threat of, like, not getting reelected. But reelection should not come into your decision making. But that does come into my decision making, I don't care, frankly. But that's the community's check on the board's power, is, elections. It just doesn't feel like a check on the board's power because we don't ever get, recently, very few people run for re-election. So there's no, it's kind of like you can do whatever you want and move on. And that's, I mean, that's unfortunate, you know. But that, the community, so what the community will accept is what the board they elect will do. Because tech, we're doing lots of good community input. We don't have to do any of that. We could just draw boundaries and deal with the political fallout. I don't think we should do that, but I. But when you look at communities that have balanced these things, it's gerrymandered. Mm. I mean, these boundaries are very specifically drawn to include certain neighborhoods and change things around. And I think without doing that, we can probably we're going to pick at the margins, but we're not going to hit those. We're not going to hit Alexander. We're not going to hit a Kirkwood. Not in a way that can shift twenty points. I don't think. I mean, I you know as creative as we can get. The fact is, our community is very segregated economically. And remember, your, your, your best chance to do that is actually at Kirkwood because of the adjacency of the other elementary attendance areas. Your most challenging place to do that is going to be when you look at the Hills, Alexander, Wood, Twain, Lucas, 
because there isn't that physical proximity. That was went back in 1516 when we went through it. That was the quandary. That's why we got into double digits on those maps because we kept trying to slice up those attendance areas on the southeast <coughs> side and we just struggled with setting up attendance areas that had some level of geographic, I can't remember what a two I'd call it, but you know, she wanted them to be really geographically tight boxes kind of thing. And to try to set it up like that and try to get demographic balance, I mean, it was just an exercise in futility. I mean, the poor community members there kept cutting them up and we'd draw new maps and we'd bring them back and it was the same numbers with different attendance areas. So that's the real struggle. Kirkwood, we do some gerrymandered attendance areas. Actually, you know, we could, we could start working on that. So, the other that, ones. so maybe, a, you know, a combination <coughs> where we can, can we draw boundaries that are, you know, aren't going to look as boxy? And then where we need to, and I think, and I know that's the feedback that came back on magnets, but I wonder if we had more specific, like, would you leave your neighborhood school to have a year-round attendance or a full uh, language immersion or what? Yeah. Fine arts was one of the big ones. It to be very obvious that people would make that choice. And we did a, I can't remember if it was thought exchange or what we did, but we did something where we asked a specific question about year-round schools. Yeah. It was at the beginning of my term in 2015. That was the one that got the highest response rate yes. of all, I mean, fine arts, STEM, language immersion, there were like there five or six of them. There was a lot of interest in it. Yeah, but year-round got the, the greatest support. Mm -hmm. They did want us to have year round junior high and high school too. Um, that became one of the follow up issues with them. Well, wait a minute, my elementary kids are on year round, but my junior high kids are on school year calendar. So, which you know, we're not going to convert the whole district <laughs> to year round. I mean, we don't have, have, have air conditioning yet. So, but even if we did, I mean, I, I think that's an unrealistic plan to just do it all like in one big fell swoop. Um, but what we could do is do it somewhere to start with something and we um, we talked today she came in to volunteer <laughs> at Kirkwood and so we talked about those um, those in between times those interim those intercessions kids could be offered um, STEM opportunities and so you take away the problem of the junior high student not being home to take care of the elementary kid because you still got the elementary kids going in you know if we wanted to do that and that was one of the things when we were looking at that last time, we had a big conversation about what does year-round mean? Is it simply 175 different days of school? Then that winds up being cost neutral for the district. Or is it 175 days of school plus intercession in summer, which then winds up being a significant cost add to the district? So that, that's another thing that you gotta balance when you look at it. All your magnet schools, you remember we had the committee, the, the, I can't remember the name of that woman from the National Magnet School thing, you know, she talked about there's a sunk cost when you start because whether it's foreign language immersion or whatever it is, you're going to have those kind of startup costs that are associated with it. So that, I think that's part of the mix that we've got to think about too. Well, and I mean, I pay for a summer program for my daughter. So, you yeah. know, I, I'm paying for something, whether I'm paying for it in, you know, three week times throughout the year where I think for two months at a time. I yep. mean, you know, not not for, for not everybody is that gonna be a free thing that they, they get during that break. But for some people there might be that option. But then I wonder if there's some funding for that. Or um, if there's some, some community partners or yeah. some community partners, um, you know, like would Rockwell Collins come <coughs> and you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it requires thinking outside the box and saying, okay, we know these are the barriers, but let's figure out how we're going to overcome it. If it's something we want to do. Which is the first question. And, and money is going to play, play a big factor in that because we can't afford to do it. I mean, we can't just make decisions and then we hope we can pay for it. Well, we make choices. I we make choices. I mean, in Davenport right now, um, at, at the DPO, let's see, Sean was there, um, the, they do a fine arts academy and they have decreasing enrollment in their district and they get $105, $175 per student less than they're caught in that bubble. I don't know if you know about that funding bubble that's been in place since um, a lot of growth has started. But um, anyway, their superintendent spends 25% of his time fundraising. And he gets, and, and I, 
don't, there's no hidden message there. <laughs> I'm just saying that he spent, he goes to John Deere, um, where else did he say? I can't remember where all that. Well, John Deere was the one that he, you know, oh, it's right is, is like two to three million a year uh, from John Deere. And uh, they also have a vocational uh, high school. And I asked him after the, the meeting, I said, well, what happens if a, if a student uh, their junior or senior year decides, well, I'm at the final <coughs> and I want to go the other route. He says, no, you don't understand. We still have vocational at all, but we have the one that specializes in and has the advanced curriculum. So uh, I was very impressed with uh, what was happening in Davenport and the fact that they were facing shrinking. Uh, and he was very open. open. He talked about yes. the budget cuts and that all the things yes. they were looking at cutting. So it's not like it. I mean, he totally is like. Yeah. There was a laundry list that yeah. made me physically sick as he listed twenty things off the bat that they would have to cut to try and make ends meet because they are a shrinking district. And I mean it. Yeah, I know he said it was their, brutal. But their fine arts academy runs a two and a half million dollar deficit a year. I think is what he said. And I think so he said that that's for. all funded though. Right, but it, it run, the, the district runs a $2.5 million deficit, and then they have to go out and find $2.5 million mm -hmm. to pay for the Fine Arts Academy. Yeah, what mm -hmm. if the next year John Deere's like, eh, sorry. What's that? I said, what if the next year John Deere's like, sorry. Well, let's ask Dr. Tate that question, because yeah. I, I didn't ask that. Well, I, 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 mean, I don't just, know. I just He's know at a way, way, way smaller scale in my real life job, <laughs> I deal with donation asks every day. You know, and if, if we didn't give something to something, it wasn't going to happen, you know. And then they count on that every year. And if one year I was just like, you know what, this year I'm going to give that money to this program. And the other thing is done. Yeah, I don't know what he's got in place for that, but I, I imagine they didn't, haven't gone into a whole Magnet Academy without having a contingency plan for funding. But I, I didn't ask that question. Well, yeah, it is all about choices and what you're going to spend your money on. You talk about gerrymandering districts to try and create balance. I mean, you could totally do that. Then you're talking about significant transportation costs that you would incur, right? We don't have money for that. And, you know, it's, and there's you always start something. start just in this area where you can do it with Kirkwood and with um, I assume that's the neighboring with without a lot of transportation costs. Yeah, I think where we can, we should do that. And, and then I also think where we can pair schools, um, I mean, you, you can get some financial efficiency doing that, uh, programming efficiency doing that, and then the FRL balance, which is what we're looking for. And I think we, we probably have some areas that where we could do that, and we could um, pair those, because then you kind of double your attendance zone, and you can maybe do more within that. I think that's another piece. I mean, we talk about that a lot, and that's something I would really want to get community input on because as much as some people don't want to move their kids from one school to another, to have kids in multiple schools at the same time may be a stressful and something that may not work as well. It's definitely something to think about. I'm just, I'm playing obviously but devil's advocate. No, but think, it's wrong. Wrong. think about how stressful it is for those kids in the 75% free and reduce, and that's I, every I day, all the time. What right? I'm saying is, I'm just saying they, they can go there because they can get there, and that's their school that they can be at. Right. And I can pick my all my kids up at the same time, where they can all I, walk home together. I get it. I, the truth is, we have to, if we're going to change the status quo, we have to change some things that people are comfortable with right now. And I think what, where I'm coming from and what I ran on, and I never have shied away from this one moment, is I'm advocating for the people who are getting the shaft right now, who don't have the equitable experience. That's my priority as a board member, as a candidate, um, because other folks have it fine. Well, for, for the folks to ha who have it fine, for the folks who don't have it fine to come up, something has to give up here. I mean, something has to, right? You, you know that I... And that, and, and the, the reason I emphasize this and the reason I think we can do it is because we do agree. Despite what some people might think, I don't want to mess with my comfort zone, I feel that we have a board that says, I'm sorry about your comfort <coughs> zone, but all these people who've never had a comfort zone deserve, and we're not even saying deserve a comfort zone, they deserve an equitable education as your kid over here, because just because you can afford a half a million dollar house, doesn't mean you get a better education. And that we're, we've, as a board, I haven't heard any dissension saying, 
yeah, that's not the priority. And I know what this is what happened last time in 2009 even, exact same discussion. But as soon as we looked at the maps, the first thing to go was equity right away. Like, oh, we just can't do that. And I just, I'm not, and I could be wrong. And in a few years, people may hate what I do. And I'll get all the terrible email and I'll, but I can't in good conscience, you know, I watch that happen and people just, and a big, very diverse group of people as far as mayors and realtors and developers and teachers and all kinds of folks. But man, as soon as it, we started, as soon as we got to people's discomfort, forget it. It's gone. And I'm just not, I'm not comfortable going down that route again, despite the political fallout. Because I, I agree, we're going to run into that stuff. And, uh, and, we ha and then I think we have to problem solve. So that, and that's why I think it would be terrible to just say, gerrymander, whole district, boom. Because it's not going to work everywhere. But I think if we do, if we can find our spots where we have opportunities like gerrymander, you know, maybe see if there's a year-round magnet and, and do a more specific series, see if we can get some traction, because we need people to move there. And then the thing that comes up, if a lot of people want to go to a magnet, we don't want to displace people in the neighborhood. So, so it, that's tricky. Um, and transportation is, is huge. So I, I, you know, I think all of this is, is outside the box thinking that we're trying, you know, this is the first <coughs> conversation about this that we're really trying to dig in and say, we're, we feel like we have a board that's willing to make some big dramatic changes. What could those changes look like? Um, and so maybe Steve, I don't know if this is what we're kind of getting at, but Maybe the, we need from the admin when we would need some decisions, maybe. Because I think there's some, aside from the Grant and Garner areas, you know, there's some immediate things that we could probably do in the next year or two at Twain, Alexander, Let Me Man, you know, to address some of those issues. So, like, when would you need to have, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. We have, like, big picture yep. dreams, and we have some things that could happen right yeah, now if we wanted to do it. Yeah. Now, so what's the time my answer is that that's kind of a moving target because if the question is what do Amy and myself, what do our building principals, what does the transportation department need, we need to know in April. We need to know in March. For what year? For next fall. Okay. I mean, we got to move teachers around, we move teachers around, we got to move bus routes around, we got to move bus routes around. We can do that. I mean, you know, you just stop doing these things, do that thing, get it done. I can tell you that the last time around when we sat at the 2015-16 thing, we had the parents say, if you want to change my attendance zone, then I want you to tell me this March for a year from this fall, because I need time to process this. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm telling you that was our feedback, was give us a year, because we need time to plan. So. So it's not as much what we need logistically, because we can turn pretty quickly. I mean, we've got reassignment rights inside the contract. Durham runs our, our bus routes for us. I was telling Phil earlier, we just got to write them the check. They'll run the routes. They got all the addresses mapped in there. We just need to give them the ArcGIS maps. Boom, they're good to go. We can do that in a very short period of time, but what does the community expect us to do, right. I think, is the question. So just to touch on your point, I know you said it's fair and proper, but at the same time, to touch on something JP said, you know, if there's something we can do that affects Twain for next year, that's fair and yeah, right for I those agree. kids yeah. there to not have I to just, wait for something to happen. And I, I will say at Mid Prairie, they made a decision what in April and oh, yeah. they implemented it in August and it was somewhat unpopular and uh, they gave a presentation at the ISC conference and yep. they also had spent Somewhat a be, uh, long time giving them the point <laughs> so of view. Oh, they did. Huge committee input. It wasn't like it just came up. And no, no, no. It, wasn't, it was a two-year process yeah. of getting to that point. Yeah. However, they implemented it very quickly. You've got uh, it, it, a lot of your uh, suburban districts yeah. in Des Moines. Uh, literally, they'll right now, they're looking at where the subdivisions are going up and they're making decisions right now and actually some of them i've seen them as late as march you know what your neighborhood's going to her school next year because that school is too crowded and that room now is empty seats because that subdivision didn't build out <laughs> we're just circling your neighborhood and sending it over there you're gonna you know I mean? i'm not even stopping by your house to tell you i'm just gonna send you a letter and saying by the way now you go over to godwin elementary school because that's what's easier for us 
that's the culture in their district. I've talked to some parents there and some administrators, and they say, yeah, we just we do that in the spring. We just move people around. Um, obviously not the expectation, and sat to those meetings with me, not the expectation of the parents that were in the meetings the last time around. So I would think if, if we want to have that conversation, we should invite folks in. And, and Paul, to, to your point about the urgency, I think um, if we consider this is something that's really never been done, if we make a, a decision to do it, I'm certainly okay waiting a year if we have a commitment that we're going to do some things and we take that year to get input because that feels pretty urgent to me. I don't think it has to happen for the fall, but if we know we're going to make some changes, I do think giving the community the time to process and, and give us the input, you know, like to me, if you're talking about 30 years, a year is pretty urgent or a year and a half, right, as opposed to like next fall, especially if we, I mean, we know we're going to ruffle feathers and so we, you know, there's a way to do that that can be a little you know, more respectful and, and process oriented and, and getting input and validating people's experience and feelings that that I think rushing, we're going to miss a lot of opportunities to one, make people mad and then maybe not even do a very, I mean, we want to do a good job of this too. We want to make sure that we're thorough and we, because there are going to be, you know, those things are going to happen. We're going to, if we try new things, we're going to have new problems. And so then we're going to have to work sure. through those. And There'll I think be some unintended yeah. consequences Definitely. that we're not prepared for right now. <laughs> We'll have to work through. But if we have the commitment, that's not saying we have, you know, if we have the commitment, to me that makes the, it's like, okay, we're committed to this. And now what does it look like? Because I think, the, you know, getting more heads involved is going to, you know, not too many, but more <laughs> and yeah. different perspectives. I think we really need to know what we're, we're committed to. And I, I think, uh, you know, kind of being the champion of the cause and really getting out there and say, look, this is why we're doing it. We're not just doing it because we want, you know, 427 kids at every school. That's not why we change boundaries. And here's real tangible reasons. And all of our kids will benefit from doing these things. Like, it's got to be results-based and show people that there's a positive. And, and I think that's fair to even to Paul's point, if there's something we could do for next fall, if you show a positive impact to whoever is involved with that decision, and you're more likely to get buy-in. And we all know we're not gonna please everybody, but we can at the very least say, this is what we're going to do, and this is why we're doing it, and it's for the right reasons, and we're looking for results to get out of it, and here's what we're doing. And you said that earlier, right? It's like, we're gonna do it, well, and Sorry about the comfort zone. That's our job as board members, too, I think, and community leaders to have those. You know, I ran at Brian Kirsten, I ran him in the hospital the other day, and he had, you know, his kids went to Schimmick, very uh, homogenous school, and now they're at Southeast. And he's like, and he was just like, oh, man, the difference in my kid's friend group is really exciting. Like, it's, it's, that's really cool. And it's like, well, yeah, and once you have that experience, I think people, but right now, I think the people in their comfort zone, they're afraid. And they're afraid because they hear all the bad things. And they don't un understand, you know, it's like, they don't know what's on the other side. And once you see that, it, there is a little eye-opening of, you know, diversity is a really, like, a really good thing. I'm just saying that because it's politically correct. It's like, you know, we, you know, <laughs> as someone who grew up in a not at all diverse place, it's really exciting when your kid gets exposed to you know, the kinds of things I could never expose them to because I don't have the experience or the culture. And, it's, and I think when people see it, but the hard part is when you see it in a 75% school as opposed to 50, that's, that's different, right? You're now, now you're talking about trauma and poverty and things that are, you know, obstacles that are so uh, deep that you're gonna have a, hard, a different educational experience. And so we do have a goal because it's in our plan yeah. to get everybody to within whatever. What is it? Fifteen percent, or yeah. yeah. So we we have a plan, we have a goal, and now we're just and we did it right. It happened. I mean, that was our election, right? Was to do this at the high school level, and we've done it. And so now I think it's like okay, look, we're just going to follow what the previous board had decided and continue to move down this path and do it at the elementary level, which we all knew, everybody knew, the previous board knew that was going to be the hardest, hardest. Yeah. And I, I think I guess what my point about the stuff that we can change now, like we have some opportunities, even if what we change changes with the bigger picture, 
uh, you know, when Longfellow opens up next year, it's going to be a totally different school. You know, their population for that one year is going to be what it is, and that's going to change for 2019 because Hoover kids will get new Hoover kids will get pulled into new Hoover. But you know, there may be some chances in there where we could maybe take some Twain kids and move them in there because there's space, and that will help out next year at Twain as well. I, yeah, I think those kind of those micro you know, movements. That stuff has to be like if we're going to do that, mm -hmm. we got to talk about it and get it done. Yeah. You know, no, so there's good. some options. I think there's, you know, if we look at schools where that may happen, you know, future, this is not right now, but next year, you know, if you're looking at man and maybe keeping some of the kids at man that we have scheduled to go to Lincoln because their homes may not be around much longer, you know, that type of thing, there's stuff that we got to look at. So. That's a good point. That's really good. And I think if we could think of things in terms of what we're already doing. Like, for example, Longfellow is already going to move into where we're doing in 2019. So, 2018. Or, or 2018. Okay, so 2018. So, like, maybe that's the time to make a change. I mean, instead of making the teachers move everything twice. Right. But what I'm saying is, like, we may make that change, and then if we make an even yeah. bigger change overall, that may get a well, I would everybody. say perhaps we should look at it in a longer spectrum and say, well, it makes sense, you know, or, or you know, like, I'm just going to throw this out because it's on the bond. Borlaug is a, is a school that's on the bond. It's, it's more towards the end. But um, if we wanted to change something that would send more kids to Borlaug, we could build that into our facilities plan before we get to Borlaug. Sure. We could say, this is our plan. We could accelerate send. the Borlaug stuff so that if you wanted to do some kind of attendance zone changes with Kirkwood, that you could do it sooner. Or you, this, we would just like yeah. make it all fit with what's already happening anyway. Yep. Yep. You know. And if there's any silver lining to the whole process, I can tell you that the 10-11 discussion was the worst one just because they hadn't had the discussion in forever. It was painful. Well, that's an understatement. An I'll take painful as a good adjective, though. That was bad. Yes, it was. 15-16 <laughs> wasn't as bad. In certain areas. I'm going 13-14. I'm going, or 13-14, sorry, yeah. 13-14 wasn't as bad. There wasn't as much caustic dueling microphone, yelling at each other, neighborhood kind of stuff in 1314 as there was in 1011. 1516, I think the discussions were deeper, and, and but again, I, I think it was a richer conversation. So I think the community is maturing in their conversation about attendance areas. It's, it's never going to be easy, because it's always good for me to fix your problem. That's great. That's when it's my problem, I don't want it fixed. But at least, I think, each time we do it, our community gets better at doing it, which I think is a silver lining. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's an opportunity. So like, I guess maybe to touch on my point maybe one more time, in, if we have another work session on this in March, right, is what we're saying? Yeah, I think that's Got it. I think there's I think actually, we're about it in there's, February. yeah, there's February. Yeah, we've got, like, I got already March past February. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have February and March, right? So that's two yep. more chances before that April timeline when you need it, roughly. So, like, if if board members or whoever wanted to come up with ideas, and could we like present those, you know, as a here's something we want to talk about at the next work session? Then? Absolutely. And if you give, <laughs> well, I don't want to try to step on Adam's weekend time too much, <laughs> but I mean, if you give us a week, if you say, hey, I'm thinking, what if this line just like we did with Penn. What if I drew this line up here? Adam and I and Amy and the team, we will sit down tomorrow in a couple hours. We'll knock that off. We'll crunch the data for you. By the way, it's Weber, not Wickham. That was my mistake on the thing out there. The number 24 should have gone down and the line above it should have been Weber. I found it already. Um, but you know, we can do that for you. That one was because I was doing it on Sunday afternoon. But I mean, if you give us a little bit more time, we can get that to you in a pretty quick turnaround. So if you've got some ideas and you want to share them with us, we can get into the mapping software. We can give you some feedback pretty quickly. I'm wondering if our principals could come back with their ideas. Of, you guys have the students. You know your neighborhoods. 
you know your families? Um, could, could you guys come back to us and say, the, you know, I think this concept, whatever, if it's a pairing, or maybe it's, you know, I think a boundary changes better in my neighborhood, or maybe, no, we think maybe magnets make sense. Or all three, in order of preference. I, I, would that be something? We can definitely get a survey out to them, get some feedback. Well, I, I not, not necessarily a survey, but I would like them to say from their educational experience with their population and their families, what is going to have the most educational impact? Sorry, and what I meant was we get a Google Doc out to them so they've got the ability to fill that in, because obviously we've got five of them here, and we've got 15 of them that aren't, so get some, we'll need some time with them to explain what we're asking them to do. Sure. Then we can get some kind of Google Doc out that they can fill in, because Part of it is they think about uh, their neighborhood. But okay, so I'm thinking I should peel this piece off because if I peel this piece off, well, where does that go? You know, Jeremy and I have had that conversation as we're looking at it and we're saying, okay, what do we do with that? Where does it go? So there's a lot of dominoes with it. So we want to be, them to be able to see, okay, what are my neighbors suggesting and what is that? Mm -hmm. What impact does that have on me? But you know, for example, Jeremy might say, you know, I, I think that twain a good solution is a pairing. Or mm -hmm. he might say, no, that's not going to work. I think we need boundary changes here. Because it would be helpful for me if I heard from the principals what would really work in your mm -hmm. area. Because I don't think that there's a one-size so solution, one-size-fits-all solution. I'd, I'd like to see us try a menu of things. Mm -hmm. I would like not to, to say, say no. I could be real excited about doing that process with the thought that something's really going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because... I've been thinking many of us have been at this same table since 2011 and has felt like, oh, we're just banging our head against the wall. That sounds kind of negative, but this is going to take bold, courageous decision making. And what I heard at the table tonight is different than what I've ever heard before. It's pretty encouraging. I, 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 that is my sense, is that we have, I mean, I think through the campaign, you know, the four of us that were running, and well, Paul, you too, because you were down there, uh, the farmer's market all the time, and you too, Phil. Um, uh, and, and so even, it just feels like there's a, a, a I, I haven't heard any dissension yet. Like not even, and I know when we start getting really angry email, like we're going to have to stand up and, and be courageous in the face of that. But so far, so good. I mean, it, it feels it's that the... strength of conviction, though. And I think you've expressed it, everyone's expressed it well, and I think that's sort of speaking to what... We need the strength of conviction to why are we doing this, what's the value, why do we believe in this, and then go and do. Share the message and go and do. I, am, I mean, I, I love the idea of collecting inputs and ideas. Um, I also want to pay attention to what you're saying too, Paul, that are there some things that we can do really short term, even for next fall, that are small. I mean, I, so back to the, the conversation, getting very tactical, and I'm also watching the clocks. I think we're supposed to be done at 10, aren't we? Um, oh, that's, oh wow. Yes. What a far it's I didn't even know it was 10. Anyway. Oh, wow. Um, I get so all wrapped up in the conversation. Because we're on the 13th, that might be too soon. Or not? If we have you, you said if you had a week, you know, to for Adam to spin some um, maps and ideas. If we as board members have short-term ideas, or others have short-term ideas, we should get them in and try to start yeah. addressing them. Well, maybe you just add it like we did when we were doing GeoBot talking. You just put it on every work session, and if it was yeah. good, you yep. talked about it. So. You didn't have it. You didn't talk about it. That's yeah, good. I think yeah. that's good. Yeah. You just modify it so it's in there, and then there's yeah. always a, a parking lot opportunity for us. And I think here, I would love to hear right. from the principals. I mean, you we'll guys know better than anybody. Just and, development. And, I, and I would say, what are your ideas, irrespective of any political worry? Just logistically, tactically, what works? And then, because we, I think we have to start with a big, throw a lot of things out there to see what's going to stick. One thing I'd throw out is we have a lot of conversations, and around this table, you've all referenced neighborhoods a lot, and neighborhoods. And talking to neighbors, but yet you want to change it. So we can't we can't embrace both those ideas at the same time. You can't say we're going to have neighborhood schools and love our neighborhood schools, but then want to change how that looks. Yes. So we have. I mean, that's just that's just an observation from me over here and listening to the conversation. But we can't. Those those probably don't jive terribly well when you want to then 
change where students are at. So well, they call it, I, I say it all the time at this table when that's brought up. Neighborhood schools is how you define it to me. So what school my neighborhood goes to, that's my neighborhood school. There's also people that say whatever school is closest to my neighborhood is my neighborhood school. So it's how we define it. And I always will say my definition of a neighborhood school for me personally is whatever school my neighborhood goes to. I would go further and say wherever your children attend school, that can become your community. Mm -hmm. And take out that word neighborhood. That's right. mm -hmm. And focus on who, who's the people you're doing life with. That's mm -hmm. your community. I love, that's, yes, I love that perspective. Because there well, they are little communities. And it, it is what you make it and, and what you contribute. And we are, I think the truth is we're going to... Which really works with the name of our district. The big C, right? Because mm -hmm. we're probably going to change some neighborhoods. We're going to mix them. I mean, I, I think it's going to be hard to make a significant impact if we don't redefine what our neighborhoods are. And some of that happens anyway. I mean, what's a neighborhood in North Liberty? If something that's only been, you know, is it just a development or is it, I mean, nobody's been there, or very few people in the whole town have been there for 20 years. The other thing, I, I just I want to say, because oh, we're getting close on time, the other thing I would say, we're, we're really kind of focusing in on <laughs> the IFRL schools, but, you know, we could focus on the other end, too. Right. I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking of that already, because I, you've heard me say it a lot, but in 2019, Lemmy's going to go from a double-digit school to a single-digit school, unless we keep <coughs> kids from a certain area at that school. Mm -hmm. So maybe we hear from our other principals, yeah, um, everybody. you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and hear from them. What do you think it should make? What? Mm -hmm. Or well, I'd like to speak for Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of waiting because you've been talking about the high. But for the past two years, my staff has been very excited. We've been learning. So excited to look at 1920 because in our neighborhood contiguous boundaries, RFL is expected to rise dramatically. ELL. We have been learning. We're excited for it. And to hear that possibly now we might not get. Um, you know, some of the population we're expecting is kind of sad. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of sitting here going, I'm, you know, we, we're we excited, we're jazzed. We, you know, it's a new challenge. It's, it's um, what we go into teaching for. So I would be sad to see if, you know, um, things like that would change. You know, staff, we adapt to whoever, but we want to have time to prepare. So while well, if it's two months, six months, or a year and a half, that's great, but just so that because there's opportunities afforded to schools with higher FRLs than what we get for learning opportunities, especially resources, where we've had to be, you know, um, we don't have as access to as many resources and things, which is fine, because I firmly believe resources need to go where they're most needed, but that would be a big shift in the, na in the community for a lot of the schools. Um, I just wanted to say that. We were excited for you know the changes that we were looking forward to in 1920. And you know you saying that because um, I was meeting with Laura daily, and and she said when she was at Wickham, that's all she wanted was like more diversity. And so I don't know if it's true, but my sense is that for the most part, staff gets pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. The pushbacks usually from parents who have a different idea of what that means, and they say things that are. Sometimes it's the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it's all in how you approach it. If your staff is confident mm -hmm. and they, they trust in what they've been learning and have the support to, to implement, that fear you know, can be unfounded. Yeah, I, so. I guess just to counter your point somewhat, man, is, I know, you know you're excited. If the educational outcome is better that they stay at man, then you should be excited for that too as well. Yeah. I. So. Yes. Maybe there's some other population we can. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's a Julie doesn't that, want to let yeah, it go. Yeah, she wants to keep them all. That's good too. I understand. Yeah. That, so. And I well, and the truth is, if we are impacting the high FR, I mean, that is going to impact all of the low F. I mean, right. it, mm -hmm. it, the, the kids are going to go somewhere, and the, and the goal is to get it within 15 points so that we have these. And the truth is. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're really successful, we might lose some funding because we might have schools that don't qualify for certain things, which, you know, I, don't, I mean, I guess that it's... an okay unintended consequence. What? I said that's an okay unintended consequence. I was going to say, yeah, hey, that's, a, that's not a bad problem to have if we have this more equitable... We may not need as many resources. Because mm -hmm. we, we probably... I mean, you think might we know... Need 
five reading teachers exactly. if a classroom teacher can handle the needs mm -hmm. of the group of kids that are there. Yeah, I maybe. believe that. Those are big ifs, but maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like the idea of the short term. I mean, we're talking about a lot of different things, but I think at, at 20 especially, there, there are some ideas that could be as early as next year that may not impact as many people as the North Liberty tennis area that we're talking about. So. Yeah, um, I think what you guys call them, somebody said micro changes or something. Yeah, yeah like the, the kind of low hanging fruit and, and going with that. And I'm happy to offer. Yeah. Any we'll get a doc out, we'll get feedback from all 20 of them and make sure we have that for you. Can for I, the next I, would, session. I would specifically like to hear from the administrator's point of view their thoughts on uh, paired schools as good, bad, and different. I've heard from several community members with the idea and I have heard from a few teachers although I would say most of those have been specials like librarians and music teachers and things because they can more target their library or their music sure. group to a certain age of kids um, I haven't heard a lot of it from other teachers or from principals so just kind of curious as to where you guys land on that um, as a potential thing do you want to do that now, or do you want to get feedback? Uh, I think we all want we to We can include to that in the yeah. doc. We can specifically yeah. ask them to react to that and maybe think about if, if you think it's a positive, who might be a good partner. Okay, yeah. Can we have a comeback next time, if you're willing? I really appreciate it. Could you start yeah. earlier? Yes. <laughs> 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 they're, all, they're all emailing me. What time do you think this starts? I said, we start time. I said, maybe 8 o'clock. <laughs> Our agenda is a little bit lighter next time. Yeah, week. it is. A lot lighter. This it is. is we had, we had a lot of stuff on today. Last time, last oh, time, we last time we were rocking and rolling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we were <laughs> rocking and rolling last time. Right. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you all coming. I know it's late. Yeah. 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 It's really helpful for us. Yeah. And we know you all have jobs to go to tomorrow too. So <laughs> it's not for us. Yeah. 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 There, there was a time when yeah. we went past ten o'clock. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, get up at like five thirty. Motion to adjourn. Second. There you go. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, guys.